Hey, Village Church, it is so great to be together from wherever you're tuning in from. We are just so glad that you're here. And my name is Caitlin, and I'm the director of Global and City Impact. And what an incredible close to the year that we had for our City Impact partnerships. We, our expression in the local community is what we call City Impact. And we had community groups in Edmonton putting together Christmas shoe boxes for Samaritan's Purse. We had community groups in Toronto serving local organizations like the Shelter and Food Bank. And across our lower mainland sites, we were able to raise over $8,000 in gifts and gift cards and food items to bless over nine City Impact partners and just people who need that extra support in the, at that time of year. And one of my favorite partnerships for City Impact um, partnerships is we go every year to one inner city school at our Surrey site. And for the past five years, it started off as the kids being really excited to just receive this Christmas gift. And for some, it's their only Christmas gift they might receive that year. But over the years of us showing up, the kids now get so excited in November, December that Village Church is coming to bring their Christmas gifts. And it is such an awesome day. We receive a whole bunch of cards in return and it's an opportunity to just bless these kids and bless the teachers as they go out into the Christmas season and so continue with us in the coming year our Christmas portion is just a small portion of what we do for our communities we want our cities to be transformed by Jesus and that's by mobilizing you the church to be out into the community and so partner with us in this coming year and we're really excited because women's conference is coming up online on January 29th. You can join with us at 7 p.m. Pacific time or 7 p.m. Eastern time. And you can do this by registering at fullydevotedconference.com. And yes, you have to register to be able to access the conference. We want you to be putting together a watch party. So there's a whole bunch of information to be a watch party host. Gather your friends, whatever the restrictions are in your area in Canada or around the globe, we want you to join in. And it's a great opportunity to invite your friends. Also, by going to fullydevotedconference.com, you get to check out this incredible merch. We have, you don't want to miss it. That's like one of the best parts about this conference is our design team put together amazing merchandise Grab some for yourself, get some for your friends, your family, they make great gifts. We have this amazing t-shirt, super retro. I really wanted this. Yours might come this wrinkly, but don't worry, you can iron it. You got this crew neck sweater that I'm wearing. We got some a really amazing beanies, perfect for this winter weather. So yes, you don't want to miss it. Get there early, sign up and be a part of this incredible event. And for those of you who did sign up for the in-person, you will be receiving a refund, so be sure to check your emails. Now, let's enjoy the rest of the service together. My father saw me long before I called his name. My heart an enemy, but still the sun he came. Set his feet upon the soil. Heaven's full in his gave his body to be broken, gave his spirit up for sale. The curse of death that ruled was slain by heaven's slain. The fracture threw all things under Christ's strong name. Now redeemed young men shall be given to oh what joy now lives within me as all things remain new and this song shall never cease to the one who bled for me it's a day
All right, all right. How y'all doing, you all right? Come on. Oh my goodness, good to have you here. If you are joining us uh, at Village Church Online, good to have you. If you're at any of our sites, our physical locations, good to have you. And uh, man, we are jumping into this message because uh, there's a lot to unpack. So if you got a Bible, John chapter 8, last time uh, we hit the first half of a very famous story, which is found in John chapter 8, and it's uh, the woman who's caught in adultery, and these guys drag her in front of Jesus, and they say, hey, listen, what are we going to do with her? The law says we got to stone her, and we talked about a whole bunch of ideas uh, last time, and so we're going to hit part two of that, and, uh, and let me just say this uh, to start, that I remember as a kid, uh, I would get like a toothache, uh, and I would, wouldn't want to tell my mom that I had a toothache because... If I told my mom I had a toothache, then I'd have to go to the dentist and actually get that thing fixed. And that's the problem, is that I just wanted it to get better without having to do the hard thing that's going to actually make it better, which is what we tend to do in life. We want to take the easy route. We don't want to have the hard conversations. We don't want to have the things in our life that are going to grind us, that are going to cause us to have an existential crisis to say, am I actually right with God? Am I right with my marriage? Am I right with my money? Am I right with my sex life? Am I right with my work life? Whatever. But it's going to take those difficult conversations in order to get the freedom that we actually want. And this is what we see in this story, is Jesus has a confrontation with the religious people. They bring him this, this woman, she's caught in adultery, he's sitting there, and they bring up the law. And they say, the law says this, okay? So the law, the Pharisees were the religious people. They were the people, they were the religious neat necks, the people who had all their theology in a row, and they didn't have any room for sin, right? They didn't, like, th these are people that... And I, I, I talked to them, you know, recently, I, uh, we did a, a sermon, it was called, uh, you know, I love Jesus, but I swear a little. And I get emails, why I don't, can't go to a church with a title that says you swear. And I'm like, okay, well then go to another one. I don't care. Here's a map of a whole bunch of churches that would never have a sermon called that. Just go to one. Right, that's kind of the religious spirit in people is they don't realize their own brokenness and so they become religious in themselves and they're constantly bringing up the law and saying this is the way it's supposed to be and if you fall outside of it, I can't even hang with you. I got no time with you. I don't I want to understand your brokenness. I don't want to understand your sin. And we bring up the law for people. And some of you, you've got your life so figured out that no one who has any sin in their life would feel comfortable around you at all. And you have no time for those people. And so they bring up the law and they say the law is going to do this. And the great solution to the law, of course, is the gospel, which is what we're going to see Jesus do. Because the kind of humility it takes, which we'll talk about in a second, to actually have your life changed by Jesus versus religion is vastly different. And the humility it takes, this is why the Beatitudes start with, blessed are the poor in spirit. Do you have a poverty of spirit or do you think you're always right about everything? Do you have a poverty in spirit that says, I actually need the grace of God in my life and I'm not perfect. If you are, you're not probably gonna feel comfortable here if you think you're perfect. Because if you're looking for the perfect church, I'm telling you, don't attend it because you'll ruin it. That's people driven by the law. That's their mindset. What does it take? It takes, this week I got an email from a guy. He said, uh, his name is uh, uh, Daniel Winter. He's a pastor in Ontario. And he emailed me and he said, hey, I recognize that you did this course. And the course is teaching on how to reach people. You and uh, another guy did this video course. really good. But, you know, the, the, the funds in my church aren't, like, I don't have any funds left for my own resourcing to be able to afford to take the course. So maybe... Like, next year I can take it, whatever. I, I'm just letting you know that I appreciate you. So obviously I worked it out. I sent him a free thing. I'm like, here, bro. And you know who that person was? He was the youth pastor at the church that I first walked into. Smoking my cigarettes, swearing more than I do now. Uh, 
just like, and, and trying to, you know, get Aaron, you know, she was like the, the, the church cheerleader, perfect girl. And I'm in there like, oh, I like her. And I start trying to date her, you know. Everything about him should have been like, get this guy out of our youth group. Instead, he leans into me and he starts to mentor me. And when he starts to get me preaching and he starts to sit for coffees with me and we start to, jer- and he leans into me in all my mess. This guy leans in and sits with me while I ask the dumbest questions that have ever been asked in the history of Christianity. And he sits with me week after week after week and loves on me and gives me opportunities I am not prepared for. And here he is 20 years later, emailing me asking if he can take my course. That's the kind of humility it takes to follow Jesus that you do not have this thing figured out and maybe the student could become the teacher one day. Those are different approaches to life. And Jesus blows up the law approach in one sense. So they say this. Now, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. And so Jesus raises this, they raise, of course, this question of the law. And so let me just say this to us. Uh, Now that I've said the law will destroy you, there's a piece of it where the law is actually a good thing. And what I mean by the law is the God of the universe sets up certain commandments and certain ways of functioning. And here's the, the mistake we've made as a culture. We assume that any rules are a bad thing because in our culture, in the modern world, the ultimate reality, the ultimate thing that we all shoot for is our own personal freedom. So in cultures and history, you would do self-sacrifice for the common good. You would say, we have a tribe, we have a people, and the decisions we make in life are driven by what's good for the common. And so you would self-sacrifice. That was the great heroic narrative. In our culture, because of modern therapeutic thought, You are the only thing that matters. And so self-sacrifice isn't the thing. Self-assertion is the thing. You need to insert yourself into the story. You are the main thing. You are the core to the story. How you feel inside. You might feel this way inside, and so you need to go after this in your life. And you will sacrifice everyone and everything in order to go after that thing that makes you happy. Because freedom, individual freedom, has become the ultimate paradigm of how we live. And yet, Jesus comes along, Christianity comes along and goes, no, 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 there are times when God says you actually need to live this way. And we go, see that old Christianity, I can't believe in it because it's going to ask me to believe in the rules and the book and the ancient ideas and traditions. I don't like any of that stuff. I just like to do what I like to do, right? It's frozen, right? You know that song she sings? I'll sing it for you. (sighs) It's time to see what I can do. To test the limits and break through. No right, no wrong, no rules for me. I'm free. Right? Let it go. All right, so that's, that is the chant of our own soul. There are no rules There are no right or wrong for me because that's the only way I'm free. And Christianity comes along and challenges you and goes, hold on a sec, all this talk of freedom. The ultimate question in life is not whether you're a slave. You are a slave. You're not free. None of us are free, ultimately free. The question is, what are you going to be a slave to? Because there are choices to be made. Let me give you an example. Of course, our culture says go inside of yourself. The gospel comes along and says deny yourself. Our culture says you do whatever you want with your marriage. You do whatever inside tells you to do with sexuality. You do whatever you want to do because your personal freedom and individual thought is all that matters. 
And Christianity comes along and goes, there are times you have to deny your own proclivity because you are actually born sinful. And the natural state of your soul and the woof of your soul actually isn't God glorifying or self-flourishing at all. And so you have to constantly deny yourself, not look into yourself for salvation. And so I'll, I'll give you an example of this. So Timothy Keller in his book, Making Sense of God, gives this illustration. He says this, uh, you're a 65-year-old man and you love to eat whatever you want to eat. All right, you, dr- you eat steak, you drink wine every day, you are, you chocolate, you just like the worst appetite ever because that's what you want to do. That's your freedom and no one's going to tell you any different. But then you also like something else. You like spending time with your grandkids. And you go to the doctor one day and the doctor looks at you and says, you're going to have to actually eat vastly different than you eat right now in order to spend time with your grandkids, in order that you have a full life. And so now you have this decision to make. Do I continue the freedom in eating whatever I want, but that's going to restrict me from the freedom of spending time with my kids because I'm going to be dead? Or do I restrict myself from this thing in order for me to flourish? What am I going to do? And Timothy Keller points this out. He says this, there is then not just one thing called freedom that we either have or we don't. At the level of life lived, there are numerous freedoms and no one can have them all. If he wants the freedom of sustained loving relationships, he will give up the freedom to eat what he wants. We have to decide which freedom to sacrifice for the other and we all do it every day. The question becomes which freedom is truly liberating. You can't go into your own feelings and say, well, if I just listen to my own feelings, that's true freedom. The gospel comes and says, you can't look inside yourself to your own dreams and your own desires. You can't look from within. You actually have to look to without. You have to look to a savior outside of you. Now there's a limit in the law, of course, because Romans 8 says what the law promised, God actually did by sending Jesus to accomplish what the law could not. So here's what happens. They bring the woman, such women. We talked about that we talked about the first half of this. So what do you say, right? So they come to Jesus. What do you say? The law says this. What are you going to do with this woman? And they try to trap Jesus in this moment. And the reality is, here's the problem. They're trying to trap Jesus, but they're wrong. And this is where the humility of our life needs to come in. Some of you think you're right about everything, right? You think you're right about vaccines, You think you're right about masks. You think you're right about politics. You think you're right about theology. You think you're right about religion. You think you're right about your family. You think you're right about everything and you got no space for anyone to ever challenge you. So you live in an echo chamber of people that believe the same stuff and no one ever is able to come in and say, actually, what about this? Or what about that? On all sides of these issues. And this becomes the problem is we get ourselves into a scenario where God can't actually interrupt us, and yet we have to have the kind of humility that goes, I could be wrong about this. You know what the crazy thing is? This is not the last person in John chapter 8 that these guys try to stone. Chapter 8, verse 59, listen to it. Talking to Jesus, Jesus says, truly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Verse 59 says, so they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. That's how this chapter actually ends. People who are wrong about stuff. Do you have the humility to realize that sometimes you're trapping Jesus? That you think you're smarter than God? And we go along in life thinking we're right about things. Isn't it beautifully freeing? I'm going to tell you this right now because I want to free you. Isn't it beautifully freeing to know that you are not ultimately in control of all things? That the God of the universe is actually in control because if you got, we talk about this often, if you got the things that you wanted back in the day, your life would be a disaster. Right? We know this. That girlfriend in high school that you wanted and now you see her and you're like, thank you. Lord God, that I didn't get her, all right? Or that guy, right? The guy that you really want, oh man, I just really want to get, and now you see him and he's, you know, still just sitting at home playing video games and you're like, oh man, thank you, Lord, that I didn't marry this guy. 
whose sole purpose in life was to marry a girl with a good job. <laughs> like, what a loser. So we want these things in life, but we go after them, and the reality is we're wrong. And the kind of humility it takes to say, listen, when I moved out to Vancouver, my main thing I wanted to do was become a professor. Right? I didn't want to be a pastor. You guys know this. Because footnotes don't talk back and come up with dumb ideas. And they don't cheat on their wives. And they don't complain about the volume of worship music. Footnotes never do that. People in libraries just sit and chill. And I was going to be a professor. I was going to read books for a living and get a PhD and move to the UK where it doesn't rain. And I was just going to sit and do, talk to students and mark papers and, and, and just like that, pastoring. No. People are the worst. I don't want to. Right? And I was wrong. Some of you are like, you weren't. You weren't. You should go do that. You're awful at this. <laughs> I was wrong. What I wanted to do 20 years ago, guys, I was wrong about. How many times have you said this week, I'm sorry? How many times have you looked at a friend, a spouse, sat across the table from someone, for those of you who are allowed to go out to restaurants, <laughs> and said, I'm sorry? I'm sorry. I made a mistake. I was wrong. This is part of the Christian life. It's called repentance. And some of you need to just stop taking yourself so seriously all the time and realize the humility it takes to actually follow Jesus versus thinking you're right all the time and thinking that you need to be in control of all things. It's a kind of humility that says, see, let me practically just say to you, humility and embracing the idea that sometimes you're wrong about stuff is the way to your own joy. Because then you're, like, just let, like those of you who are married, just, just feel the freedom of the idea that you don't always have to be right. You don't have to be the fulfillment of your spouse's life. Right? Imagine your spouse, every morning they woke up, and when you woke up beside them, they were just staring at you, ready to just give me joy, give me fulfillment, give me meaning and purpose in my life. You'd be like, get away from me, you stink. It's too much pressure. Don't put that on me, Ricky Bobby. Don't. I can't take the stress and the pressure of you trying to get fulfillment through me. And so if you just approach your marriage like, I'm just trying to survive here, bro. Don't look to me for fulfillment. Think of how freeing that is because you can, man, I screwed up again. How humility is the way to joy because humility is the way you wake up every day and go, my gosh, I deserve to wake up in hell today. But I didn't because of the mercy of God. And then every day is like, every day is a bonus, right? Like, why are you here right now? Some of you, you walk in here with some swagger, like you're so cool. You got money, you got a good marriage, you got success. Dude, you know the reason you're here right now? Because God decided not to kill you last night. That's it. All of us should just be sitting here in awe of that. Just, ah! I'm alive. I want to live every moment to the full. I want to suck the marrow out of life. Carpe diem, Robin Williams, give it to me. That is a cultural joke that anyone under 20 does not understand. But <laughs> I'm feeling old these days because all my illustrations are from the 90s and my kids have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, come on, Christianity's like the Matrix. <laughs> Take the red pill. And they're like, Dad, shut up. All right, so... So here's the thing, the kind of humility of recognizing you're wrong sometimes. Okay, that was, so what do you say? That was that. So, okay, so, so then verse six, all right, says this. 
This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. They're trying to bring charges against Jesus. Not a good plan, by the way, when ultimately you're going to stand before him in judgment. He might bring that up. <laughs> so, oh my gosh, this, look at this. Jesus bent down. Do you know how beautiful this phrase is, bent down? This is the kind of humility we're talking. So, so those of you who are exploring uh, Christianity, exploring spirituality, and you're like, what religion am I going to believe in? In the marketplace of ideas, what's the greatest thing I can, and, and some of you might be studying Islam or Buddhism or, or Judaism or Mormonism or Jehovah's, whatever. And you're exploring different religions. Here's the beautiful thing Christianity offers you. When people say, I don't believe in God in conversations with me, I always do a follow-up question. What God don't you believe in? And they usually pitch some idea of the old man in the sky, you know, with a big beard or a Zeus image that you know, shoots down things at you when you do something wrong, or the flying spaghetti monster, or the Gaia God, you know, whatever, whatever God they have a picture of. And I say, yeah, I don't believe in that God either. What God are we talking about? Here's what Christianity offers you. The lone idea in the marketplace of ideas that Jesus is God who bent down. He came into the world for you. He didn't stay up in the, in the, in the comfort of heaven and hope that you could find religion, better yourself, go inside yourself, find your inner divine spark, and then maybe one day you'll join him. He bent down. He got down literally and metaphorically in the dirt for you. I did um, a young adult uh, service recently. We were chatting, and a guy came up to me at the end. He just gave me a big hug, and he goes, uh, hey, man, I'm from India. I grew up in a Hindu home. My whole family's Hindu. And I started watching Village Online, and I came to know Jesus. I gave my life to Christ, and now I'm discipling other people. And now my family and friends are coming to know Jesus and I'm sharing. And I'm like, that's not easy, man. Right? In our culture, it's like you die for that stuff. Right? My brother-in-law came from a Hindu culture. And when he became a Christian, his mom literally chucked a knife at him. Like this is not fun and games. And so you're coming out of a culture that believes in, in two or three hundred million gods that are removed or you're coming out of a culture of atheism where there is no God, or you're coming out of a culture of agnosticism where you're not really sure, so you're not going to make a choice, or you're coming out of a, a Muslim idea, a very unified, uh, kind of disconnected version of God, and then Christianity comes along and says, blasphemy of blasphemies, God entered in. He bent down, came into the world in order to save you. This is a beautiful thing. He came down here because you could never save yourself, guys. New ageism is wrong. Tony Robbins is wrong. You're not a winner. You're a loser. <laughs> and that's why Jesus had to come bend down. Right? He had to enter in. And that was dangerous for him. That was my, um, my buddies uh, on their honeymoon. They went to Hawaii and uh, learned how to scuba dive. And their first scuba, like, and this guy is terrified of any animal. Uh, he's like me. I just don't, I just don't love animals. They're, they can do a, a weird things. So he gets in the water. He learns. He's like, yeah, what about sharks? What about sharks? He's like, don't worry about sharks. We're in Hawaii. It's like, yeah, that's what I'm worried about. So they go down and they do a scuba, and they're with this group. And then they got tired, and they went up to the boat, and they're sitting in the boat. And this group was supposed to come up like 20 minutes earlier and no one's to be found. And they're like, Where, where's this group? There's like eight people. They're not coming up. And they wait 20 minutes, whatever it was. Finally, they came up and they're like, they're all just white as a sheet. They're like, what's going on? And they're like, didn't you, didn't you see what happened down there? They're like, no, we came up in the boat. And they're like, we're down there. We're swimming around. And we look up and there's four sharks circling us like this. And so... They all got, I guess you're supposed to, you all get, so you look, try to look really big and you all lock arms and they all locked arms and they just sat at the bottom of the ocean for 20 minutes in dead silence, staring up at these sharks. 
And my buddy was like, my gosh, if I was there, everyone would have been dead, right? Because <laughs> I just, I, I would not go like that. Uh, I'd be like, blah, 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 blah. Get, punching, kicking people, screaming all the bubbles, and the sharks go, eat everybody. When you enter down into an ecosystem that is foreign to you, it is very dangerous for you. You can get eaten alive. It is dangerous. And the story we follow, the God that we follow, is the one who left the perfection and the glory of heaven and all delight and all pleasure and gave it all up and entered in so that we might have the glory and delight and pleasure that he has. There's no better story than that, guys. There's no better news than that. You can't create that. Jesus created that for you. It's a scandal. And you gotta wrestle with it. Because some of you believe it may be in your head. You gotta wrestle with the scandal that it is because it's a, it changes everything. At this, uh, at this night, this young adult night, after I'd spoken, this guy walked up to me, had a very encouraging conversation. He said, bro, I want to talk to you for a second. He pulled me aside. He says, hey, listen, uh, you're a nice guy. <laughs> no conversation that's good starts with that sentence, by the way. <laughs> you're a nice guy. Because what's the next word that's coming? But, right? <laughs> look, look, you're a nice guy. I think he actually said, you seem like a nice guy, which was even better. You seem like a nice guy. But. I've been really wrestling with the question of, is Jesus God? And I read your book. I'm like, oh, okay. And it made it worse. <laughs> That's how to sell a book right there. I'm going to put that right in the front of the book. I read your book. It made my life worse. Uh, <laughs> really? It made it worse. Why? Did it muddy the waters? No, it clarified it. It was so clarifying that Jesus really actually did claim this, that now I resent God and I'm frustrated because I can't believe it. So I cognitively now know it, but I can't bring myself to actually believe it and define my life by it and treasure it above every truth in the universe and I don't know what to do. And so what do you pray for in that moment? You pray that God would do a supernatural work that would transcend the cognitive ideas of your life to make it stick at a heart level, an affections level. And what better to do that than understanding and being awe that Jesus bent down, that he came into this world in order to save us. Here's what John Stott, a preacher, died a few years ago, said. Nothing in history or in the universe cuts us down to size like the cross. All of us have inflated views of ourselves, especially in self-righteousness, until we have visited a place called Calvary. It is there at the foot of the cross that we shrink to our true size. We can stand before it only with a bowed head and a broken spirit. So what happens? He writes with his finger. <laughs> I love this. On the ground. Jesus. So this, adult, this woman caught in adultery. They drag her out. And he sits down. And he starts to just write on the ground. Now. He, he, what he ultimately goes on to say is. Uh, anyone without sin, you know, cast a stone. And they all leave. Remember that story? Here's what Jesus is doing. Here's what he's channeling. Remember that story in the Old Testament about Solomon? And these two women come to Solomon, who was this king who had great wisdom, and they show up and they go, Solomon, there's a baby, and we both think it's ours. So this is before the time, like now, like that probably wouldn't happen. Though I do know people who, who breastfed on the wrong mother for like three days. And then they were like, oh, sorry, we got the wrong kid. Right? I actually know a church where the mother in the nursery just breastfed another kid, but that's a whole other story. Anyways, so uh, 
It won't happen here. Don't worry, guys. I just saw three mothers go, what the crap? I'm out of here. <laughs> so, uh, so but, but back then, they didn't have like DNA tests or whatever. So these two moms are claiming that this kid is their kid. And so Solomon just comes up with this great thing. He's like, okay, you're both fighting it. Bring me a sword. And I'm going to cut the baby in half. And each of you can have a piece. And the one mom's like, okay, great. <laughs> and Solomon goes, clearly not the mother, you're out. And he gives the mom to the baby who said, no, 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 don't worry about it, don't cut the baby up, just give, just give the baby to her. This is what Jesus does in this moment. He cuts through both groups with a moment of wisdom that actually to that world would have rocked them. So in the ancient world, people would draw with their fingers on the ground. They didn't have chalkboards or whiteboards or whatever, so they would draw math equations or philosophy. Rabbis would sit and draw. Teachers would sit and draw, and they would say, here, you know, here's, a, here's what I'm thinking. Here's an idea. And so that's what Jesus is doing. Now, there's all kinds of suggestions, of course, about what Jesus drew with his fingers on the ground. There's all kinds of ideas about what is he actually drawing. Is he just doodling? Is he drawing a giraffe? Is he drawing like a picture of somebody? What's he doing? Of course, we're not told. And of course, we should retain the mystery. There's all kinds of, when you read commentaries, people are like, is he writing, you know, an Old Testament passage about adultery? Is he writing an Old Testament passage about how many witnesses? Is he, is he talking about how you're guilty of similar sin, you know, and so you shouldn't try, what's he, what's he saying? Um, I have a theory. I actually have two theories. I haven't read these theories anyway. These are mine. So, you know, don't put much stock in that. Um, here's, my, here's, here's one theory. Okay, I'm going to give you both my theories, uh, and I really like them. Okay. Here's the one. In that culture, in order to carry out a stoning of someone caught in adultery, you needed both people who were caught in the act to be present. See, here's what maybe, Je maybe Jesus in some legit mic drop Beast mode moment is drawing this. <laughs> oh, that's, can you, can you, can you see that? Where, where? Come on. That would be legit. <laughs> Why is there just a woman here? And we talked about this in the first half, about how we've just done women wrong throughout history, and it's always the woman who's getting charged. Where's the dude? Did you, because you had to see the people doing the act. So you guys busted in a bedroom, went, da. And there had to be two of you, so you went and got Joe. Hey, Joe, I think they're in the room. Let's go. And you went and watched. And then what happened? You got her, but he took off? Maybe he just goes, where's the man? Dummies. Because I can't stone her unless he's here too. Because I actually have to stone both of them. And of course, now all of them start to leave. Maybe that's one idea. Second theory I have is he's writing a passage in the Old Testament about the fact that all of Israel are adulterers because they cheat on Yahweh every day with the false gods that surround them. So remember, they would, they would, they would worship the gods of Babylon. They would worship the gods of Egypt. They would worship the gods of Assyria. And God would constantly in the prophets go, you're actually cheating on me because Israel's my bride and when you go worship false gods, you're an adulterer. This is why, go read Hosea this afternoon. It's a great prophet. God says, I want you to marry Gomer, greatest name in the Bible. Gomer, and Gomer's a prostitute. She's a hooker. And I want you to marry her to symbolize to Israel the fact that every day Israel cheats on me and is an adulterer. And maybe Jesus is writing and going, you're all collectively adulterers, so who should I start with? 
and they all start to go away. Those are my two theories about what he's writing. Now, here's the problem with this, is these people have judged her outright. They're wrong about the judgment, and you and I constantly judge other people and are wrong about the judgment, and we misunderstand who we are supposed to be in the story. Because as if you've spent any time here, you'll know that I never let you be Jesus in these stories. You're not righteous enough, you're not good enough, you're not pure enough. You are the woman caught in adultery in this story. We are all adulterers. Every day you cheat on Jesus, right? Every day you sin. Every day you do. Every day you choose another God. You choose your beauty. You choose your intellect and how smart you are, how cool you are. You choose your money, you choose your, whatever it is, you swap the, the absolute satisfaction that the God of the universe can give you in Jesus Christ out for the things of your life and you're constantly doing it. You're an adulterer, but you're also the group, see, we say, we go, oh, these dumb Pharisees, I can't believe how self-righteous these guys are. That's you! I literally had a couple come into my office a few years ago and go, we're leaving the church. I said, why? Because we saw that you hang out with this particular person and they're very sinful. Are you serious? Wow, that's vastly interesting. Have you read the Bible? Are you serious? That's literally what they did to Jesus. They went, oh my gosh, he hangs out with drunkards and sinners, tax collectors. Let's judge him. And Jesus is like, I don't care. I came for the sinners. That's what I'm doing here. If I hung out with you, I'd be bored. <laughs> I literally came for these people. Why wouldn't I hang out with them? And I just saw in their life, this neat neck, religious life that was like, just don't let the door hit you on your way out. I don't care. Jesus came to hang out with drunkards and sinners and tax collectors. Yeah, but you hang out with this, you hang out with, of course I do, it's my job. You should fire me if I don't. Like, yeah, but so, you know, I think so-and-so might have, you know, hit a strip joint. Did I go? Well, I didn't see you there. Well, okay. Do you think I might have challenged him? Well, yeah. Then what are you saying? I don't know. <laughs> if your life is so pure that nobody can relate to you, I'm not talking about actual righteousness. I'm talking about the, the, the posture of it to the world. You know, isn't it crazy that sinners actually liked Jesus? That should blow your mind. Like people actually liked to hang out with Jesus. And then there's us 2,000 years later. And everyone looks at us and goes, I don't know what those people are on about. Honestly, I don't know what they're into. But we'll just let them be the church people, the weird Christians. And we'll carry on with our life. Church leaders do the same thing. I know church leaders that are so narrow in their theology that when we changed our theology about women pastors here a couple years ago, they literally stopped talking to me and inviting me to things. What are we doing? Are you serious? I, uh, I walked into this place this week and I had my uh, Problem of Jesus book that I, that I wrote. Uh, 20 bucks on Amazon. Um, and uh, <laughs> and I, I was reading it to, to go speak at this thing and kind of just reminding myself of a couple things in it. And so I had it kind of at the top of this pile. And she goes, what's that? I'm like, oh, it's a book about Jesus. She's like, oh, I don't read books about Jesus because I'm gay. I'm like, well, why not? And she's like, well, anybody who believes in Jesus hates us. Is this where we got because here's the beautiful thing about Jesus, man. He doesn't let you just do whatever you want with your life, but he doesn't stone you either. He 
doesn't just let us do whatever we want. He'll constantly challenge your life and your sin. Of course he will. That's what he does. He's not going to let you stay where you are right now in any part of your life. Forget just sexuality. Think about my insecurities, my sins. You know, I'm a pastor, but I have sins. I had to think really hard about what they were, but I, I, I do have them. And here is, here, you, know what, you, know what my, you know what my sin is? Let me tell you what my sin is. You want to know what my greatest fear is? Some of you might think it's like, oh, village church goes small and nobody comes anymore and the church shuts down. That's not actually my fear. I, to be honest, I just go do something else. With my, I don't care if the church is 100 people. I don't really care. We do that. Or I just go somewhere else, work somewhere else. People might offer me a job, you know, whatever. Doing something. So that, that's, I don't care about that. What I care about is that you like me. Man, that's an insecurity. I like to be liked. Right? Anybody else like to be liked? (laughs) We all like to be liked. That's my sin. And so what I do is I get into these things where I just screw up because I tell everybody that I'm going to be for them everything they need me to be. And then I leave and I'm so tired. I'm like, I can't. I don't know what to. My great flaw is that I will... I will woo you away from your job and you will come work at Village Church and then I won't see you for four months. And you're like, yeah, but I came to work and I'm working at Village Church. Me and Marky, we're going to be hanging out. No, no, no. I just wanted you here because you're awesome. But I won't see you. (laughs) Or I'll sit with you and you'll say, can you come to my thing? Can you do my this? Can you, can you do my funeral? Can you make sure when I die? I've literally said, can you make sure when I die, my kids are taken care of? Yeah, yeah. Wait, what? What did I just get myself into? I can't take care of your kids. But I just want to be liked. We all just want to be liked. That's my sin. So Jesus isn't going to let me stay there. He's going to constantly go, man, Where does your identity come from? And so at Village Church, we're going to challenge your materialism. We're going to challenge your gossip. We're going to challenge your sexual sin. We're going to challenge your pride. We're going to challenge your arrogance. One writer says this, sin was not treated lightly by Jesus, but sinners were offered the opportunity to start life anew. And so when we understand the cross and we understand the grace that it brings, we stop being judgmental and we realize I know pastors who literally would criticize other pastors for hanging out with the Dalai Lama and with Muslim leaders. They would see them on social media and go, why are they hanging out with them? That's not right. And then they would trash their leadership and trash their church. It's like, what else are these guys supposed to be doing? Just hanging out with their church? Bored. (laughs) All right, let's end this. Verse 7. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Here's the most beautiful part of the story. Let's see ourselves in this. Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And then this. She said, no one. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. From now on, sin no more. Whoa. Here's why they were trying to trap him. If he doesn't stone her, he's a bleeding heart, weak liberal. If he does stone her, he's a traditional conservative. So we're trying to figure out, is Jesus liberal or conservative? Which party would he vote for? Come on, Jesus. Don't you believe the Bible? Stoner. It tells you to, so do it. Don't you take the Bible literally? Here's what conservatives love to do. They love to look backwards. And they make the past ideal and say we need to move backwards 
go back to the good old days, and that's where salvation is found. Make things great again. <laughs> Here's what liberals do. They look to the future, and they say, if we can just be progressive enough and get to the future, that's where salvation is found. We should either never stone anyone. That, that's the liberal spirit, right? Just whatever. Your sin doesn't matter. Heaven, hell, it's not real. Everyone goes to heaven. Believe whatever you want to believe. Go inside yourself. Think whatever you want to think. The Bible's just stories. It doesn't matter. Jesus didn't really rise from the dead. It's not an authority. Believe whatever you want. We're all just going to get along. Let's go, Canada. Blah. And Jesus says, I don't want you to sin anymore. There is a thing called sin. There is a thing where you offend God, people, and yourself, and you need to stop it. And yet, he says, I don't condemn you. Let me end this way. Here's the beautiful part of this gospel moment. Listen to these words. Order matters. If you're taking notes, write down this. Order matters. Here's what I mean. Religion will tell you this. Sin no more, and then God won't condemn you. Clean your life up. Stop doing this sexually. Stop doing this, stop doing this. Make sure you take this many, uh, you take this many trips and do this many prayers and do this much. Jesus never asks this woman to serve in a soup kitchen for three months in order to have penance for her sin. Never does it. What a loose guy. Just lets everyone do whatever they want. Yet he goes, sin no more. But notice the order. He doesn't say, sin no more, then I won't condemn you. The gospel that Jesus preaches is, I don't condemn you because of my work for you. Now go sin no more. It's not based, guys, on your performance for God. It's based on his performance for you. And then once you're not condemned, you're empowered to go, now I can live life in true freedom to bring glory to God and for the good of people. Not constantly trying to earn God's favor because you never could. That's why it's called grace. Literally, by definition, it is undeserved. And that's the only way to be free. Which is why later in this chapter, Jesus uses exactly those words. That the son of God, the son of man, will set you free. And he says you will be free indeed. Father, I do pray that as we seek freedom in this, this room, online, the different sites that we'd stop looking to ourselves and we'd stop looking to religion and we'd stop looking to moralism and we'd stop looking to mysticism and we'd start looking, stop looking to all the different things we look to, our own beauty, our own success, our own marriage, our care, all the things that we substitute out and we would look only to the gospel, the beautiful reality that you entered in, died on a cross for our sin, rose again for our salvation and that we could never earn it and so we rest in your performance and accomplishment for us and believe every day when we wake up that it is finished and there's nothing we can do to add to it and that our righteous life would come from that place, not toward that place. In Jesus' great name we pray, amen.
pure voice and with us sing. Oh, praise Him, Alleluia. Thou burning sun with golden beam, Thou silver moon with softer gleam. Oh, praise Him, oh, praise Him, Alleluia, Alleluia.
It is so incredible that no matter where we're worshiping, we are able to be united together and with our God. And we want you to know that we are here for you. We want to help you grow in community and continue on being a fully devoted follower of Jesus. So please reach out to us by going to thisisvillagechurch.com slash connect with us. And we want to invite you to partner with us in giving. Your giving allows us to do so much more than just what happens on a Sunday or the amazing programs that we give you and your family. But we're able to, like I said before, go into the community, reach people for in the darkest places of our society and around the globe, and your giving does that. And so if you have been giving, be assured that your giving does make a difference, and we are so thankful for you. You can give by going to This Is Village Church church.com slash give or by texting 77977 and we'd love to have you partner with us. Thank you again for joining. It has been so great and we'll see you next time.